Hi, my name is Lavinia. This is Peter. Welcome to Games Made Easy, a channel to learn board games quickly and easily. Today, for Theodore's birthday, I am very happy to teach you and give you tips on how to play Merchants and Marauders, one of my favorite pirate games. What I love in Merchants and Marauders is how many ways there are to win. You can be a bloodthirsty pirate or a rich merchant only interested in gold and still compete for first place. Or you can alternate between a peaceful merchant or a sneaky pirate, depending on what fits your game, which is really cool. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe. In Merchants and Marauders, two to four captains decide to go on an adventure. They take command of their ship and they set sail from their hometown in the Caribbean as traders of bananas, sugar, rum, cocoa. En route, they will find fortune and glory either through trade, plunder, battle, exploration, believing in crazy stories, or completing heroic missions. Their ships will grow with their fame and fortune. Players try to make a name for themselves from Nassau to Trinidad, whether as an influential merchant or a dreaded pirate, only one player can gain eternal glory. Once a player reaches 10 glory points, the game ends. Merchants and Marauders is not complicated, but it does have a lot of components. Let's have a look at these components as we set up the game, starting with the main board. The main board is divided into 17 sea zones. In the middle is the empty sea zone of the Caribbean Sea. All around are 16 sea zones, each with their own port. Each port belongs to one of the four nations in the game, Dutch, English, French or Spanish, and has a unique advantage or disadvantage. This is where you move all the ships in the game. There are 26 plastic ships, sloops, flutes, frigates, galleons and man of war they are managed either by players or by non-playing captains npcs each player also has a player board to keep track of their ship its upgrades and special weapons the captain the crew the gold and cargo as well as ongoing rumors and missions each player also receives a treasure chest to safely stash gold there are also 10 custom dice which have a skull icon instead of the five and the six these are used for all roles during the game Rolls are successful if you have at least one skull. Now that we've seen most of the components, let's set up starting with the player board. Each player gets one player board and we select a captain. Randomly draw one of the 16 unique captains that are full per nationality. They each have their own unique abilities and invite a wide range of play styles depending on how much they score in each of the four skills ranging from one to four. The wheel here represents seamanship and is really important during combat. The spyglass represents scouting and is used to find other ships, as well as treasures and hidden islands. The cutlass represents leadership and how well you lead your crew in combat and for recruitment. The chest represents influence and is a measure of the captain's reputation. It helps gain the trust of employers and rumors at the local tavern. All the captain's four skills add up to ten except for Christian and Pepine, who are at nine, but have awesome abilities. Finally, captains have a home port. This is where they keep their treasure chest and where they start the game from. Keep your captain face down for now. A good captain needs a good ship. At the beginning of the game, pick from one of the two starter ships. Choose the sloop for a nimble and fast ship, well suited to piracy. With the flute, you sacrifice speed, but you add space for extra cargo, which is great for a merchant. Take the corresponding color and ship, place five cubes on your player board to match your ship, place your last cube on the zero of the glory track on the main board, take 10 gold pieces and place them here. Shuffle the 70 glory card deck and give one to each player. If you receive one of the 16 specialists, it doesn't join your crew immediately. You first need to recruit him in his port before you can use his special abilities. All the other glory cards will help during the game, most of them during combat, but a lot of others also add nice quirks to the game. Place the main game board in the middle of the table and place the remaining glory cards, captains and ships next to it. Place one merchant ship token face down on each sea zone. Merchant tokens, when flipped, show the potential nation of the merchant ship. Place one demand token face up on each port. These represent goods which are in demand in this port and will be sold here for six gold instead of three. Shuffle the remaining tokens and place them in a pile near the board. Also, place one ship modification token face down in each port. 
Place the ship's special weapons near the enemy space. Also place the five brown tokens on the leftmost space of the enemy ship. Keep the bounty tokens in four piles, one for each nation near the at-war space. Place the four naval tokens here and place their respective frigate on them. Also place the pirate sloop and pirate frigate here. Keep all remaining ships miniatures nearby, the remaining flutes and sloops, the frigates and the galleons. All players now reveal the captain and the ship they've selected. Move the five cubes on your player board to match your ship. Toughness is for both the hull and the masts. Maneuverability is not a characteristic you mark with a cube. It indicates how agile your ship is and is used to prevent merchant ships from escaping. Finally, place your ship on your home port. Now let's look at the missions and the rumors. Shuffle each deck and place it near the board. Now, both are very useful because they give you glory points once fulfilled. Now, rumors are easier to accomplish than missions. However, they are not always true. For now, reveal the top two mission cards, read the description aloud, and place them on the board. All missions have a requirement which must be met before you can claim it. They also mention what you would earn and also the location where you can claim it. Some missions also require roles before they can be claimed. If the role fails, leave the mission in play. A new attempt can be made during a new port or sea zone action. So, for instance, for the Royal Escort mission, you have to transport the cousin of the Spanish Queen from Caracas to Havana in the next six actions. To claim that mission, you need an influence check and no bounties at all. Once a mission is claimed, put it face up on your player board. Also draw a new one and place it on the board at the location listed on the card. In this example, if you succeed the mission, you gain 20 gold, but if you fail, you receive a Spanish bounty as you are suspected of kidnapping. You can only have one mission at a time. If you want, you can discard the previous mission upon claiming a new one. When you complete a mission, you gain a glory point and a glory card. You also gain a glory point and a glory card when you find out that rumors are true. Since these are easier to accomplish, it's well worth the investment. Rumors are found in taverns as part of port actions. You're basically buying drinks to someone who is telling you tall tales about some wonderful stories across the Caribbean seas. Pay two gold and roll an influence check. On a successful roll, collect your rumor card and place it face down on your player board. Like missions, you can only have one at a time, but you can replace it if you pick a new one. When you reach the destination, roll the required dice. For instance, this one, you need to go to San Juan and roll an influence check. If you fail, the rumor was false after all, and you discard the card. If it's successful, the rumor was true, you can bask in glory, score one point, and collect one glory card. Randomly draw for first place and place the events cards deck near that player. Now let's look at the events cards. They fall into two broad categories. 18 of those bring a new NPC on the board. 12 of those are admirals from either one of the four nations and six are pirate captains of either a sloop or a frigate. Each has a seamanship, scouting, and leadership value, and that's why they are placed face up. There's only ever one of each in play at a time. The other 16 are actual events. They're also used to move the NPCs, which are already on the board. Five of those are storms, which you should avoid if they are too strong. Four start or end wars between nations. The other seven add a nice flavor to the game, and I'll let you discover them. Finally, we have 64 cargo cards, which are used for trade, but also to resolve merchant raids. There are eight cards for each of the eight goods, cocoa, food, rum, spices, sugar, textiles, tobacco, and wood. They're all the same in terms of gameplay. At the bottom of the card are icons and numbers. Each good has the same amount of gold. Half of them have three gold and then one of each for one, two, four, or five gold. Half of those icons show the location of a damage, and the other half is an escape icon. Finally, give a player aid sheet to everyone. It is extremely useful. It has a summary of pretty much everything in the game. You have the port actions, you have the sea zones, the special weapons, the modifications, combat. So keep it close by. Now that everything is set up, we can start the first round. Each round consists of three steps. First, we're going to draw and resolve the event card. 
Then players will take their action turns, like port actions, merchant raids, players or NPCs, and then we're going to resolve the end of round steps. The first player draws the top card of the event deck, places or moves NPCs, and will read the card out loud. If you draw a new NPC, for now place this event card in the C zone indicated on the card. This is where it will move at the end of the round. If you don't draw a new NPC, move all the NPCs matching the flag on top of the card in the direction indicated under the flag. If that direction is blocked, move to the next available C zone in clockwise order. Once you resolve the top part of the card, the first player reads the event itself. They are all clearly explained on the card. This one is actually a storm, a hurricane. So what will happen is any ship that is at sea will only have two actions. If you're in port like this one, you have three. But any ship at the end of the round that is not in port will take five damage. To avoid the effect of the hurricane, which is pretty bad, the ships should be in port at the end of your action. If the pirate NPC sails in a sea zone with a merchant player, he scouts for it. If there are more than one, it'll first target the one with the most gold on board. If a naval ship NPC sails in a sea zone with a pirate player, that's any player with at least one bounty, it scouts for it. If there are more than one, it'll first target the one with the most bounties from his nation. Now we can start the action phase. Starting with the first player and going clockwise, each player may take up to three actions. The possible actions are to move, to scout and battle, or port actions. Your first action is most likely going to be a port action. Note that there are many port actions you can take, but no matter how many you take, they all count as one single action. Let's start with buying and selling goods. For this, you use the cargo cards. To buy one of the eight types of goods, draw the top six cards of the deck. Seven or eight if you're in St. Martin or Caracas. Discard and replace all the cards with the good in demand in that port, like this, but make sure to keep them hidden. Goods get cheaper the more there are of them. If there are three or more of the same good, each card costs one gold. If there are two goods, each card costs two gold. If there's only one, then each costs three gold. So it costs the same to buy a single good than to buy three of the same. Unless you're in Nassau, where they cost one gold less. You sell each card for three gold in any port, but you sell them six gold each in ports where the good is in demand, the one displayed here. If you do so, discard that token and replace it with a random one from the supply. It cannot be the same. If you sell three or more cards of goods in demand, then you also receive one glory point and one glory card. Let's have a look at what we can do in the shipyard. The first player to start a port action in a port immediately flips the ship modification token. To buy it, pay three gold, or one if you're in St. John, and place the token on your player board. Each modification affects a specific aspect of the ship. Crew, maneuverability, stronger hull, extra shots, or extra cargo. You can only buy each modification once. In any port, you can also buy special weapons. There are three of them. Grappling hooks to re-roll seamanship rolls, grape shot, which are used against crew, chain shot to destroy masts. These also cost three each. And you can also only have maximum one of each. Of course, you can also sell or buy your ship for the price indicated here, plus one gold for each modification and minus one gold for each damage to the ship, not the crew. Note that you can transfer special weapons and crew to your new ship, but it's only when you are in St. John that you can also transfer the modifications from your old ship to the new one. If you return modifications, place them back randomly on the map. You will still need to recruit more crew if you have room for more. You can recruit new crew for free on a successful leadership role, otherwise at the cost of two gold for each crew. If you've been damaged, this is also where you can repair your ship for two gold for each damage repaired. Also, if you're in your home port or in St. Martin, you can stash some of your gold into your treasure chest. For every 10 gold you stash, you get one glory point. You can stash as much gold as you want, but it can never count for more than five glory points that way. Keep these points hidden until you reach 10 glory points. For missions or rumor actions in port, watch the first part of this video where I explain both during setup. Finally, ports are also where you recruit specialists on a successful influence role or by paying two gold. You'll basically flip the card face up. Note that you can have many types of specialists, but you can only have one of each type. 
And that's it pretty much for all the port actions. Note that if you are selling goods, it has to be your first action, although the other actions can be done in any order. Now let's have a look at scouting, moving and fighting. Your next action is to move. Leaving a port or entering a port, as well as crossing into a new sea zone, each count as one action. So you could spend your turn simply leaving a port, crossing into a new sea zone, and entering a new port as your third action. Keep in mind that you cannot enter a port if that nation is at war with your nation, or if you have a bounty from that nation, unless it's bribe officials in Port Royal. Note that you don't have to spend all your three actions, you can pass at any time. Now let's look at scouting. This is what you have to do before you engage any ship in the same sea zone, whether it's with another player or when you start your turn in the same sea zone or you enter a new sea zone and there's an, a hostile NPC ship. Roll the number of dice indicated by your captain's spyglass. Note that an NPC captain's scouting roll is either the value on his card or is equal to the number of bounties from their nation the player has, whichever is highest. So for instance, if a French admiral scouts a pirate with four French bounties, his scouting value is four, not three. On a successful roll, you find the enemy ship. If it's a merchant ship, represented by this token, flip the token to find out its nationality. At this point, you can still choose not to fight, but if you do attack, you can choose whether to take a bounty from the nation on the token or if you prefer, you can change it to the nation of the port in that sea zone. In this case, a French bounty. Congratulations, you are now officially a pirate. To fight merchant ships, draw the top three cards of the cargo deck. This time, ignore the goods and only look at the bottom half of each card. It shows a number and an icon. Half of those icons show the location of a damage. Each icon inflicts one damage either to the hull, cargo, masts, crew, or cannons, distributed roughly equally. The other half is an escape icon. The gold number represents the amount of gold on board. Roll for seamanship and keep every success. You use these to add a new card or replace or cancel one of the cards already in play. You can also use your special weapons to transform one of your seamanship dice into a success. Discard one special weapon token for each die you want to change. All special weapons types are the same for this. You win if the number of escape icons is lower than your ship's maneuverability, and you still take the damage from the hit icons. If one of your locations goes below one, you lose. If, however, you win, you can keep all the cards your cargo can hold. You can also replace some of the other cards you had. You also keep all the gold mentioned on the cards. If that gold amounts to 12 or more, you also score a glory point and take a glory card. Remember that you cannot keep more than four glory cards in your hand, so if you receive a fifth one, you're going to have to discard down to four. Now, let's look at fights with other players and NPC ships. The scouting is the same, but the fight itself is very different than with merchant raids. If you start a fight with a non-pirate ship, you're going to receive a bounty as soon as the fight starts, whether it's a merchant, a naval ship, or another player. Now, at the beginning of the round, captains are going to declare their intentions, starting with the aggressors. Captains can shoot, they can board, or they can flee. Now, in the first round, you can only shoot. So, let's start with that. If a captain has long guns, he starts by rolling one damage die for each of the cannons on his ship. Otherwise, each captain rolls for seamanship. Add one die to seamanship if your ship's maneuverability is too higher than the other ship. The captain with the most skulls wins. Resolve ties by adding all the other dice. Now, if both captains declare they are shooting, the winner rolls one hit die for each cannon on his ship. Captains who tie or lose still get to hit, but only one hit die for each skull rolled up to the number of cannons on the ship. If there's no skull, both start the round again. To assign a hit, roll the dice and look at your player board. A one hits cargo. You might have to discard randomly the excess cargo cards. A two hits masts. If destroyed, you only roll one die during seamanship and you can only shoot. You cannot board or flee anymore. A three hits crew. If you lose your entire crew, you can no longer choose to board and you'd automatically lose crew combat if you get boarded. And a four hits cannons. You inflict one less hit for each cannon lost. 
If a location goes below one, it is destroyed and any excess hit is assigned to the hull. If the hull is destroyed, the ship sinks and the captain dies. The skulls allow the targeted player to choose the location to damage, unless the attacker plays a special weapon. If he plays a chain shot, all skulls can be assigned to damage the masts, while the grape shot will ensure each skull kills one crew. If you use your reinforced hull to cancel one hit, flip the token as you can only use one once per combat. If you choose the board action, you can use the grappling hooks to re-roll any number of dice, discard it like other special weapons after you use it. Remember, the excess rolls on destroyed locations have to be assigned to the hull. However, excess rolls on destroyed locations using special weapons cannot be assigned to the hull. Now, let's have a look at the crew combat. This is when a captain decides to board and wins the seamanship contest. This is a good time to use the swivel gun if you have one. Like any other ship modification, flip it over once you've used it. At the beginning of each round of crew combat, both captains roll dice equal to their leadership. Each skull reduces the enemy crew by one. The maximum damage you can inflict is the level of your crew at the beginning of that round. It can be brutal. Repeat until one of the crew is reduced to zero. If both are reduced to zero at the same time, the captain who inflicted the most damage in the last round is the winner. In case players tie with skulls, add up the numbers on the other dice to resolve the winner of the crew combat. You capture all the gold, special weapons and rumors. You also take the cargo, glory cards and specialists on board. Discard those you don't want or can't keep. If a captain captures the enemy ship, whether it's a player or NPC ship, you may plunder the losing ship. If you do, claim the enemy ship in its current state, including damage and any ship mods. The crew, however, comes from your current ship. If you plunder an NPC naval ship, draw three cargo cards and add the gold you collect. Then randomly discard a cargo card per hit the ship took to cargo. You can keep track here. The remaining goods are yours if you want them. If the player was a pirate, they'll get rewards which I'll discuss shortly. Now, sometimes the best decision is to flee. If both captains decide to flee, then that's the end of the fight. Now let me show you what will happen if one captain decides to flee. Compare the seamanship role for both captains. If the fleeing captain has at least one skull and the pursuing captain has none, the escape is successful and the combat ends. Use and flip chasers to add one more hit on the fleeing ship. Finally, note that the only way NPC ships can choose to flee is when they have less cannons or crew than their opponent. If the pursuing captain rolls at least one skull, he keeps chasing the escaping captain and combat continues round after round until either one or both ships are sunk, the crew is eliminated, or one of the ships successfully flees. Now, let's look at some of the rewards and spoils of war. If you're not a pirate, you can collect money from the NPC pirate you've just destroyed. Collect five gold for the sloop and 10 gold for defeating the frigate. Select one nation to collect five gold per bounty from that nation. You cannot be at war with that nation and cannot have bounties from them either. In this case, you could ask for 25 gold from the French. Once you defeat an NPC naval ship, you're going to receive a glory point and a glory card as usual, but you will also receive one more bounty. So that's one bounty for starting the fight and one bounty for defeating a naval ship. Once you have a bounty, you're a pirate and will no longer be attacked by other pirates. However, naval ships in the same sea zone will hunt you. They prioritize those with bounties from their nation first, then those with other nations' bounties, and finally, those they are at war with. As for NPC pirate captains, they will go for non-pirate captains with the most gold on board, then cargo second. Also, other players get more and more tempted by you as one nation would pay five gold for your head for each bounty you have from that nation. When you gain a new bounty, place it on your board here on one. If you add one more bounty from that nation, move the first one up the track. 
The two clemency event cards, as well as the three pardon glory cards, one mission and one rumor cards will give you pardons. That's really not many, so make the most of them. Finally, let's talk about what happens when you die or when you retire a captain. You may want to retire a captain if your ship has too many holes in it or you have too many bounties. Either way, it will take one entire turn to get a new captain. Make sure you discard all your bounties, glory cards, rumors, admissions, cargo cards and gold, your special weapons, your ship, and its modifications. You get to keep the gold you stashed in your treasure chest. Of course, you also keep your glory points. Draw a new captain from the top of the deck. Redraw if there's a pirate in that sea zone. Select a new sloop or flute and place your cubes accordingly. Take 10 gold from your treasure chest and place it on your player board. If you don't have enough, take the balance from the supply. Take a new glory card and you're ready for new adventures. At the end of the round is when you resolve the event card, either the storm or the NPC events. In case a player is caught out of port during a storm, roll for seamanship and deduct every success from the storm damage. Roll that number of dice for hit location and assign the damage on the ship. Again, a destroyed hull would kill the captain, so be careful of big storms. This is also the time to move the new NPC ships. Move the miniature of the ship on their new sea zone and the card onto their spot on the board. Note that there can only be one admiral per nation or pirate type. If you draw one from a nation or a pirate type already on the board, just place the new card on top of the old one. Should that new one die later in the game, the one underneath will re-enter the game in his own sea zone. If you run out of event cards, the game stops and the player with the most glory points wins the game. Now let's recap how you score glory points. Defeating a player or NPC in combat, selling three or more goods which were in demand, plundering 12 or more gold during a merchant raid, completing a mission, finding a rumor to be true, and once per captain when buying a galleon, a frigate, Finally, up to five points for every 10 gold stashed in your treasure chest. Once a player reaches 10 glory points, the game ends. Players will complete the current round so that every player has the same number of turns. Now, in case of a tie, the player with the most points on the track wins. Matches and Marauders gets better as you play with more players. Try to play with four players if you can. It makes for a more intense experience because you never know what pirate can be lurking around the corner. It also makes you more focused on making points and smarter in planning your routes. My tips to win at Merchants and Marauders are get rumors and also missions, but definitely rumors because they are easier to complete and can be very rewarding. It's well worth going to several ports uh, to try and get three of the same goods instead of selling just two. Modifications are great, but make sure you get some special weapons before going into a fight, even against merchant ships. Planning your itinerary properly and taking full advantage of the sea zones can make a big difference. Try to avoid storms as much as possible. The damage you get from them can be crippling. Do not underestimate a sloop. A good captain at the helm of a well-equipped and upgraded sloop can be a real danger, even to a frigate or galleon. Be careful of quiet merchants who double down on selling three or four goods in demand and get glory points and a ton of money. It's better to attack them before they get the galleon. That's how you play Merchants of Marauders. There's a lot I enjoy in this game. I love how ruthless the battles can be. I love finding out when a rumor is true, fulfilling it, and the overall theme. There's just so many moving pieces. It's never twice the same game. It's by far one of my favorite pirate games. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe or leave in the comments a game you'd like me to teach. I'll make more games easy soon. Bye now.